Uh, well, dear Professor Klausner, thank you so much for the invitation. It's always for me a great honor to speak here at the good. I'm an honorary member of the society that I carry with great pride. So, Mr. Chairman and ladies and gentlemen, we're going to try to stay on time in the interest of other speakers and other sessions. I was asked to talk about what's new in emerging technologies, metabolic and bariatric surgery in 20 minutes. So forgive me if I go too fast, but I just want to give you at least a glimpse, an overview, and see if I can motivate some questions from the audience. Um, we're going to talk about, let's see if the computer does it. How can we move forward, pressing the green arrow? I do it. Thank you. Now it works. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, obesity in America. We're going to talk about the St. Pete trial, uh, single anastomosis, intragastric balloon, vega blockade, aspire assist, transpyloric shuttle, and the jealousies, which is something new that we are having in bariatrics. So what's the real problem? Well, if you look at the CDC figures between 2011 and 2014, 37% uh, of U.S. adults and 17% of our youth in the United States suffer from obesity. That's a serious problem. It's probably the, serious, the most serious health problem that the United States has. Uh, the problem is also that the prevalence of obesity has increased disease processes such as diabetes, heart disease, stroke, and the costs uh, are estimated to get up to $150 billion. So this is on an annual basis. These are the numbers that we released last year as I was the president of the American Society of Bariatric Surgery. Uh, for you to have an idea how many bariatric procedures we do uh, on a yearly basis, if you have a laser pointer, it would be great. If you have a laser pointer, yeah, the bottom doesn't work. It's okay. Um, uh, if you look at the numbers, we are talking that in the United States of America, we have probably 14 million surgical candidates every year. And we are operating only on 196,000. So why aren't we operating more? How is it possible that an operation is being considered to be probably amongst the safest, uh, including uh, lap coli, as safe as the lap coli, we are not doing more of those. So there must be a reason. Another issue you can see here is that sleeve gastrectomy has taken over the market. 53% of the operations we do in America are sleeve gastrectomy. And probably this year we're going to release the numbers. It's going to continue to climb at the expense of gastric bypass. So uh, in order to clarify what's going on in, in, in America, I did this poll. Uh, I contracted NORC, uh, which is one of the most prestigious academic agencies, and having Professor Posner sitting here in the front, based at the University of Chicago. And with NORC, we did a poll entitled Obesity in America, and this has been now sent for review to New England Journal of Medicine. I, I hope they're not going to kick it back. But what I wanted to know is what's going on in America with the obesity disease. So we had a validated survey methodology we polled 1,500 adults. We oversampled African American and Hispanics because they tend to be more obese. And what we found was, first of all, as soon as I released the numbers, the New York Times and People magazine, they were all over the place. Americans blame obesity on willpower despite evidence of its genetics, having trouble losing weight. Obesity is due to genetics. But in reality, what we found was that if you look at this number, and unfortunately the laser pointer is still not working, uh, what we really found here is that Americans consider obesity as serious as cancer. This is the first time that finally in America, people are waking up and smelling the coffee and saying, wow, this is something bad. So obesity is a top health concern for the United States. Uh, but they think that 93% that it, it increases the risk of dying, but it has to do with their lifestyle. So another important issue is the state of denial. Uh, in America, probably 60 to 70% of Americans are overweight. Well, only 47% of them consider themselves overweight. And uh, if you ask those who are really obese, you know, 89% of them think that they're overweight, but they're not obese. 
So they still live in denial. They don't see themselves as being the one that needs the sleeve gastrectomy or needs to lose a 10 or 20 pounds. Uh, what is considered effective? You know, the National Institute of Health said that if you are more than 100 pounds overweight and you're going to diet, you have a 2% chance that you will succeed in the long term. 2% chance. Well, they still believe that you need to lose weight by your own. They know that it, it can kill you. They know, they know that this is something that uh, as, is as serious as cancer, but when it comes to weight loss, you know, they still go for going to the gym and exercise, but not to go to the doctor. So um, they don't go for surgery, and the reason why they don't go for surgery is because they fear. They fear. They are afraid. I mean, we need to wake up also and understand that patients don't like to go to an operating room to lose weight. Obesity doesn't hurt. For the diabetes and the hypertension, I can take a pill. Why to go under general anesthesia? They fear the unknown. We are still not telling our patients how safe it is in 2017 to undergo surgery. And when I polled these 1,500 American citizens, I found out that 30% said that it's very safe, 30% said that they didn't know, and 30% said that it was very unsafe. Interesting is, if I take all the patients that can undergo surgery, they are all morbidly obese, they're all surgical candidates, uh, only 35% of them will consider having bariatric surgery. And if they go to the doctor, only 12% of the doctors will tell them, you need to get a sleeve gastrectomy. How about medications? And this is also terrible because FDA, we're going to be talking about evidence-based medicine. FDA has approved recently a lot of medications for weight loss. Only 17% of them think that it is safe to take medication for weight loss. So going to the next topic in the interest of time, what's new in surgery? Well, you know, the balloons, everyone thinks that balloons are going to fly in America. We have two types of balloons, as you can see here, the single balloon, the double balloon. The single balloon is the called Obrera pivotal trial. It's a multi-center, prospective, randomized uh, trial. We took 125 treatment group, 130 patients to a control. After six months, you take out the balloon. And what you see in this study is that 38, there was a 38.4% excess body weight loss at six months. The problem with balloons is you put them in and you have to take them out. It's like going on a diet. We all here went on a diet, we lost the 10 pounds, and we regained them back. So it's, tempor it's a temporary uh, treatment modality. The reshaped balloon, it's a double balloon. Here you have the called reduced trial. You see the comparable treatment groups with a dual balloon versus diet and medical treatment. And you can see they claim that with a dual balloon at, at six months, you have 54.5% excess body weight loss. But here's the truth. In the United States of America in 2015, we're talking about probably 30 million patients that are candidates. We put only 700 balloons. It's not approved yet by insurance. The other treatment modality that is coming up, it's the uh, vagal blockade. This is something that uh, interferes with the uh, efferent and efferent vagal fibers. And you can see here the results of the medical treatment group and the vagal blockade group, how they show that there is, I would say, a reasonable excess body weight loss at two years of 20%. But it's FDA approved in the United States of America in 2015. We did 18 cases. Uh, this is the truth. This is probably the saddest part of uh, the treatment of new technologies, and we're going to talk then later about evidence-based. This is FDA-approved, ladies and gentlemen. So you go, you have a meal, you have a nice gastrostomy, you hook it up to this machine, you go to the toilet, and you empty your stomach. So uh, believe it or not, this is FDA-approved. Uh, it's around. I hope it's not going to take off. Uh, but they claim that these patients at two years lose 55%. Uh, excess body weight loss. They might be, you know, in a, in a crazy house, in a hospital, uh, because they are uh, psychotic, but still, uh, you can get them to lose weight. The transpyloric shuttle, this is a shuttle that will travel to the pylorus and it will move in and out. Uh, the enrollment is complete. It's going to be a multi-center randomized double-blinded trial with 222 patients. This is still ongoing, so I cannot show you the results. This is another interesting one, which is the embolization of the left gastric artery so that you can kill the ghrelin-producing cells. It's a multi-center trial. You see the different university hospitals, Frankfurt, Ohio, John Hopkins, 
Um, this is in Ukraine, in Beirut. It's really multi-center. But you see the small number of patients. The embolized left gastric artery follow-ups of 6 to 24 months. Excess body weight loss from 16 you know, to 8.5%. We cannot say much about that. So far, worldwide, we have 25 patients enrolled. And this is the next one that's going to come up, which is the Jealousis, which is a smart pill taken 20 minutes prior to a meal. The particles are released into the stomach. They get, they get full of water. You get satiety, and then they get decompressed once they pass through the intestine. The trial hasn't started yet. They're looking for money. So far, they got $12 million in the bank, but they need to get to 42 to complete the trial. So what's new in surgery? That's about endoscopy. Well, I think the major, major, major development in surgery for us in 2015, 2016 was that 45 groups, including the ADA, believes that bariatric surgery is metabolic surgery, that we are the number one treatment modality for type 2 diabetes. And that we have to thank to Phil Shower, my partner at the Cleveland Clinic, and Francesco Rubino, who is now in King's College in London. This is the only level one, and we're going to talk about evidence trial we have in bariatric surgery, also carried by Phil Shower, five years follow-up comparing medical treatment, sleeve gastrectomy, and gastric bypass for patients with type 2 diabetes. And this has been released in New England Journal of Medicine a couple of months ago. This is the medical treatment group at five years, and these are sleeve gastrectomies and gastric bypasses when it comes to hemoglobin A1C. This is when it comes to the weight. You're going to see that with gastric bypass, you're going to lose a little bit more weight than with sleeve gastrectomy. But at the end of the day, the message is sleeve gastrectomy, ladies and gentlemen, is a metabolic procedure and treats diabetes, type 2 diabetes. Dana Tellem, who is now in Ann Arbor, Michigan, uh, put together during my presidency a very nice care path. We're trying to move into the evidence-based uh, practice. So this is going to be released with all state chapters in the United States, and all patients are undergo sleeve gastrectomy are going to be done under a care path. The, the care path has recommendations, type A, type B, based on what's in the literature, and we hope they're going to collect good data about this. This was just presented two weeks ago in Philadelphia at the American Surgical Association that I'm very honored and privileged to participate and be a member of. And this is a study trying to develop an individualized metabolic diabetes surgery score. So I showed you before that in America, most of the procedures we're doing 60% nearly are sleeves. And you see that most of the patients fit into the sleeve gastrectomy. If they have reflux of Barrett's, you do a bypass. But what do we do with diabetes? This is still a big controversy. So what they did, they look at the five-year data of 659 patients operated at Cleveland Clinic and 241 patients operated in Barcelona by Antonio Lacey that underwent either sleeve gastrectomy or gastric bypass. They looked at the long-term diabetes remission and the glycemic control. They looked at hemoglobin A1C, the, the, num the number of medications, use of insulin, duration of diabetes, and they created a score. They said, well, you can be a mild, a moderate, or a severe diabetic. And let's see how you do if I do a gastric bypass. Let's see how you do if we do a sleeve gastrectomy. So talking about evidence-based medicine, mild stage, mild stage diabetes. If you look at the remission of diabetes with gastric bypass is 92%, with sleeve gastrectomy 74%. This is not statistically significant. However, the recommendation is gastric bypass. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't cut the cheese for me. But they see that gastric bypass should be done without any evidence because the evidence is that both of them should be performed, but the sleep gastrectomy is the safest. What happens if they have severe diabetes? If they have severe diabetes, they are equally effective, and thank, thank, thank goodness they recommend the sleep gastrectomy. But if the patient has moderate diabetes, the gastric bypass seems to be significantly more efficient in getting diabetes into remission, and rightly so, they recommend the gastric bypass. They developed an app, it's available, and their final recommendation is that for patients with type 2 diabetes, you should choose the gastric bypass if they have moderate disease, but if they have mild or severe, you should choose the sleeve gastrectomy. Another big controversy in the United States is the single anastomosis procedure, single anastomosis duodenal switch, single anastomosis gastric bypass, you know, we try to make sense in America, and since bariatric surgery is evolving day by day, 
they are coming with new procedures. So we develop at the society. I started a new procedure committee, so they need to apply so that we can endorse that. The insurances will ask us, should we pay for this or not? So we look at the literature for single anastomosis, four published studies on single DS, 222 patients, 18 months to five years follow-up. If you look at the data, three of the four published studies belong to the same author. We felt like there is a lack of randomized perspective, comparative data to draw conclusions. If you look at the studies, these are really single series that claim to have at one year 58% excess body weight loss or at one year 62% excess body weight loss. We do not believe that this is ready for prime time and at ASMBS we decided not to approve this unless it's done under strict IRB control. So in the interest of time, I can say that general surgery, bariatric surgery is now metabolic. We, we cure diabetes, we cure hypertension, hyperlipidema, sleep apnea in about 45 minute surgery with a sleeve gastrectomy, which has proven to be the most prevalent and safest procedure we have currently. As far as new technologies, we're trying to look for less invasive options because I show you that patients have fear. They don't want to go to the operating room. The results are all short term. They are less risky, but they're less effective. The role of balloons, the role of the vagal block in the United States is still very unclear. There is no really good durability and we need to repeat therapy for that. At this point, we believe in multimodal therapy. We believe in medical treatment, surgical treatment. I do believe that when we develop new technologies, we need to go through a process. Uh, the process should be innovation, development, exploration, assessment, and then to do the long-term implementation. I'm a, I'm a strong believer in doing new things, but innovation and evaluation should go hand in hand so we don't experiment. You can argue, as Bernard Shaw said, that progress depends on the unreasonable man. And for those who believe in single incision, Roberts and so many other things, Dostoevsky will say, man has such a predilection for systems and abstract deductions that he's ready to distort the truth intentionally. He's ready to deny the evidence of his senses only to justify his logic. And I'm going to stop here in the interest of time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Guy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Klausner, for uh, having me here. It's a real pleasure to come back to Israel. I'm uh, actually an Israeli fan, so I really th I thank you for this uh, opportunity. And uh, 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 we will be, in the interest of time, I will not be covering the whole topic I was asked to cover in 20 minutes, so I will leave the gist uh, stuff out of my talk, just because uh, there is, in fact, not much uh, news in, 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 in surgery in just in the past uh, few years. We have, l we have seen a lot in the, in the past decades, 15 years, but not in the la last five years. So I will focus instead on retroperitoneal sarcoma, which is a very narrow field. We have, uh, we have listened to our, uh, to, to, to Rose before he was talking about a very, very common problem, why retroperitoneal sarcoma is kind of very, very rare. So we back to a very narrow field. So my dis the only disclosure I need to, 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 to deliver to you is just that my wife is actually a medical oncologist. She's a sarcoma medical oncologist who visits back to back with me. So she's in the clinic in the room just beside mine. So if I'm biased in favor of chemotherapy, please consider that this is the reason why. And you know that husbands need to make their wives happy. So, so at, least, at, least they try, at least I have to try, yes. <laughs> So what we are talking about, we are talking about a disease which, which, which is uh, kind of rare. In, in Italy, we have 3,500 sarcoma a year, 12,000 in, in the United States and 500 possibly in Israel here. They are actually difficult to treat because they are widespread. They can arise any, any side of the body. 20% of them arise in the retroperitoneum. And in fact, the incidence of retroperitoneal sarcoma is 10% is almost the one of, of soft tissue sarcoma. So in Italy, we expect 300 patients a year. In the United States, 1,200. And in, in here in Israel, like 50 per year. So it's, it's, a, it's a very narrow and small problem, but very problematic. And it's complicated by the fact that the disease is not a single disease. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's made up of a several different histology subtype and uh, by the fact that it, it arises in a in a, in, a, in a challenging space, in a complex space, 
which is in close, uh, close relation with multiple vital structures, uh, and this actually impacts the ability to perform a proper resection. So first question to you is, who is going to take care of this disease? A general surgeon, a surgical oncologist, or a sarcoma surgeon? It's a very tough question. And, and, and a lot of, of, of awareness has been risen in, in, in Europe because we have, you know, we have a national health system which are all bankrupt, basically. And this bankrupt, this raised the question, why, what, what, what should be the appropriate uh, way of uh, going ahead uh, 10 years down the line? Because we don't know, we, we need to do something for this bankrupt health system. And what, what, what should we do for this bankrupt system? The first thing to do is to try to avoid, uh, to reduce costs. In order to reduce costs, one thing that you can do is to increase appropriateness by referring patients to specialized centers. And we started from the rare cancers. And we actually were able already to show retrospectively that this is, in fact, the case in retrocutaneous sarcoma. It, this improves the outcome of, uh, of uh, patients affected by uh, retrocutaneous sarcoma if they are treated by a specialized surgeon. If you compare retrospectively patients treated in reference center with those treated in the general population, you see a 20% improvement in survival, which is kind of a lot. Uh, uh, there, was a, there was a study, an epidemiological study, run in, in, uh, in France, uh, recently uh, uh, reported at ASCO 2016, and ESMO as an oral presentation this year, 2016, where basically they put together uh, all the cases uh, diagnosed in France, 13,000 patients in four years, 2010, 2014. 14, and they managed to, to compare patients treated within the NetSARC uh, network. The NetSARC network was, was basically a network of uh, dedicated centers with those treated outside these NetSARC centers, and they found that was, this impacted both survival and, um, and uh, local control. And what, but what, 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 then the problem comes, what is a reference center? So how many patients should a center treat to be considered a reference center? Uh, there has been a uh, uh, lot of discussion about this in Europe, at least. A lot of discussion of what was the number of sarcoma a center should have uh, been able to treat, to be considered, to get a label of the certification of a sarcoma center. And the, 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 the country which is ahead of all, of, of, of all others is the UK, Great Britain. They started this process in 2006, and they in fact decided they set a number. No? These numbers also has to do with the population and the incidence of the disease in the, in the, the given country, but still the, the need to put a number in uh, a threshold uh, of the volume to identify centers, I think, we think, we feel, all feel is important. And in UK is 100, 100 statistics come a year and 25 retrobiotonians come a year. It means one every other week in order to be considered a, 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 a sarcoma center. And how can you force how can you foster referral in these centers? There's only one way, money. In the UK, it's not yet official, but the, the threat is you don't reimburse procedures that are performed outside a reference center. So the first process is identify the centers, and then you need to lobby this, this, the, the payers and allow them to understand that by doing so, they save money. They save a lot of money. This can, could also be done at, at the insurance level in the United States, although it's much more difficult because the way the people are also paid is completely different. Right? In, Europe, in Europe, it's not like in the US, so you don't, you don't pay per patient, for example, so it's, it's much easier to, to, to put this into the, into the system. So why is it important to have dedicated surgeons? Because they need to understand what they are operating on. And in order to understand what they are operating on, they need to know what the disease is, which family of disease it belongs to, and why you should perform an approach rather than another one. So and a, big, a big light has been shed on this disease in the past six to seven years, I would say, because we started changing completely the approach from a simple excision, from, a, from an approach just focused on removing the tumor, to an extended approach, to reducing the extremity, to reducing the abdomen, what was actually done in the extremity in the, in the past years, and proved to be effective. Why extended? Because because there was also an experimental model actually done in Israel uh, at the beginning of this uh, of the 2000s, where um, they did uh, an experiment on rats, and uh, they were uh, they implanted fibrosarcoma tumors in the perirenal fat, and they actually compared nephrectomy with a simple excision of this tumor, and they found that this by doing a nephrectomy, uh, 
the incidence of local recurrence was, was basically zero, and this was also statistically significant on 23 pa rats, actually, not patients, rats patients. And, uh, and it, it translated also into a survival benefit, although, of course, it was no, no, not statistically different because of the numbers, but you see that six rats were still alive, while only three of them were alive in the, in the simple excision group. So there is an, there is an evidence, a small evidence in, in, in animal models, that if you extend the resection to the surrounding tissue, which in fact at this, and these sites are organs, you improve the local control. And there was an, an, an elegant Italian study which shows that when you take out micros, macroscopically uninvolved organs, you in fact find 61% of microscopic invasion, something that you would not have expected, in fact. Some kind of invasion. It's not maybe a direct invasion of the whole organ, a full uh, uh, infiltration, but you still you see infiltration of the surrounding tissue. So, for example, here you see that the tumor is not invading there, but I, I mean, I bet you that you don't have a knife to separate out this tumor from this olivation here. <clears throat> so, by doing so, what we found that, uh, was that this the, the local recurrence rate was basically a half half of the one we would have we had in the, in the historical controls. This was also found in French series, extended surgery, improved uh, local control, and this translated into a survival benefit. So what does this extended approach, surgical approach, means? Means to resect uh, tumor surrounded by a couple of, of uh, normal tissues with at this site is, is basically made of organs rather than muscle, less, like it is the case in extremity. Uh, we don't do, actually, uh, of course, uh, uh, we don't have the same approach with all the viscera that we find because we reproduce exactly what we do in the extremity. It's, it's exactly the same. We don't resect nerves or vessels if they are not directly invaded, and we rely on barriers because there are barriers that resist to tumor infiltration, even in the retroperitoneum. Vascular advantage is one of them. Periostomy is one of them. And, and definitely, uh, so we can, we can rely on this in order not to resect all the time all the structures. So this is just an example of a tumor you actually, uh, liposarcoma, you reject the kidney, which is actually seems just to be pushed, but in fact is, is, is surrounded by fat, which is in fact liposarcoma, and you end up by having a complete, complete resection like this. So how, how often you need, you do left pancreatectomy, for example, you do it 40% of the time. This is because uh, there are tumors that arise in the lower quadrant, which do not need a left pancreatectomy, but when you arise in the upper quadrant, you in fact do it because you see the pancreas is just lying on top of it or just, in, uh, and, and, and you take it out. While when you have to manage the duodenum, uh, oftentimes you don't, you don't need to resect it. It's, uh, uh, there is, uh, you can just peel it off, the, which is easy, and this is the common situation. Sometimes you need really to dissect it out uh, very aggressively. Sometimes you just need to resect, and you can close it primarily, and sometimes you have a bigger resection, then you need to put a loop on it, on top of it. And this is something that can avoid a whipple, which in fact mm -hmm. is needed in only 4% of primary right retroviton sarcoma. So I'm talking about the approach to primary sarcoma, because the approach uh, you, you play the game the first time, so if, if you miss the chance of curing patients at the first operation, they will never be cured. They will never be cured. So we are talking about extended resection for primary sarcomas. We are not talking about extended resection for recurrence. At the time of recurrence is totally different. You have, a, 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 you have much less chance to control the disease. And vascular resection is kind of frequent, especially because lime eye sarcoma tend to arise from vessels that need to be resected, and often they arise from the inferior vena cava. So in this case, of course, you reject them. Iliac vessels are, is less common. We managed to put together uh, a paper to describe this, this approach, which is the first, actually, paper describing the approach to, retro to retrovitonian sarcoma ever published uh, in, the, in, uh, lit in English literature. And this paper was the basis to uh, create a consensus that among uh, several, big, several, sorry, several centers in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Europe and North America uh, which also is reflected in the European guidelines. Uh, 
So if this is done, one of the, one of the concerns was, okay, you extend the resection, but which is the morbidity? You are extending uh, the resection to surrounding organs, you are doing multivisceral resection, you are increasing morbidity, at which, which is the, I mean, the, thresh the threshold of the morbidity you may expect, you may, you may be happy to have for a tumor that eventually still has a risk to relapse, which is not, you're not curing of the patient. So, in fact, it is, it's safe if it is done in reference center, and we have recently shown how basically mortality is is uh, less than 2% in multivisceral resection in this disease, and major, major, I mean, morbidity, severe morbidity is occurring in 16% of patients. So basically in the same range as many other uh, major abdominal surgery for cancer. And this is in fact related to the number of organs you resect. We have actually have given a score to some of them because, for example, we score more a uh, Whipple than a uh, gallbladder resection because it's not exactly the same. But if you, if you score them properly, you'll see that basically there is a, there is a threshold, which is at, at around three, where you see that your morbidity increases. So in general, uh, is, is a, is a well-tolerated toler, uh, procedure that uh, can, can become morbid if you extend resection, especially to, the, of course, the head of the pancreas and the genome, because this is done in combination with nephectomy, colectomy, an extended procedure, and in fact, we saw that when you do a pancreatic renectomy, this is a study that was presented at SSO this year, uh, uh, the, the rate of pancreatic leak, which is actually a normal pancreas, is not, not the pancreas of a, of a pancreatic cancer, is in the 25% range with, with, with a 5% uh, mortality rate, which is it's one patient out of 20, so it's not, it's not a lot, but still, uh, it's significant. It's more significant than the rest of resection. Uh, what about uh, renal function? Because most of these patients become basically a single kidney, uh, and, and this has been a concern because if you have a single kidney, then if the patient requires, you may not be able to deliver proper chemotherapy. This is because my wife is a clinical oncologist. She actually tells me all the time. But, but, but in fact, uh, uh, we found that even uh, that the change in, in renal function is a minor one, even if you do a refractory. And even if you have a, an initial reduction of, of the renal function, then it, you always assist to a recovery in the, in, on the medium term. And most of the patients actually are able to re receive chemotherapy, uh, uh, even uh, uh, when they have a single kidney. This is also a study done by us. And the difference between the median values was basically minimal. Only one patient of ours actually underwent, had a, 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 a final uh, renal disease and, and uh, went into dialysis just because he had a contralateral kidney stones and a contralateral kidney problem. But in general, this is very, very rarely the case. And in fact, when you have a, primary pa a patient with a primary disease, your aim is to cure him. So I don't see the point of preserving a kidney to, to give chemotherapy if the aim is cure. Okay, while this is not the case in recurrent cases. It's totally different. So besides surgeon, there are tumor-dependent prognostic factors that we have learned to be, to be very much important in these days. One is histology of type and grade. So histology pretty much predicted the pattern of failure in this disease. They were felt to be all the same, the paternal sarcoma, they are known to recur, but this doesn't apply to all cases. This applies this apply to liposarcoma. Okay, liposarcoma are these patients who recur, these three of them, while lyomysarcoma, the blue ones, they don't recur. They, this, they metastasize, so it's a different disease. And, and in fact, not only liposarcoma metastasized, the blue one, but also high-grade dative liposarcoma. So we have a different pattern of failures and that need to be taken into consideration when considering surgery. This has been reproduced in several uh, large series. This is the memorial series. You see exactly the same. You see liposarcoma recurring and lyomysarcoma not recurring while giving rise to distant recurrence. And this is also uh, the same in the large 1,000 patients uh, series collected within this uh, collaborative effort uh, among uh, several centers in Europe and North America. So you have a different pattern of failure in different risk, which is histology dependent and grade dependent. And then another thing which is, has, has recently been found to be in fact a prognostic factor is the invasion of the surrounding organs. So if the surrounding organs are inv invaded, the survival risk, the distant metastatic risk, not the local risk, is higher. Has to do with biology, of course. And we also saw, saw in our centers that this is in fact the case. 
We managed to develop a specific retroviral sarcoma anomogram that takes into account most of these uh, prognostic factors and most of the, the two most important of which are histology and grade. Histology and grade. This was validated in the Asian population, was validated in the, in the, in the multi institutional series, and is in fact included in the AGCC Cancer Stage Manual this year, uh, published this year. So, this is in fact uh, the, the tool to, uh, to stage and to, and to predict prognosis in your patient. And it has been also in, translated into a, an app that can be freely downloaded uh, in, uh, for, for, uh, for uh, uh, it's called Circulator. It's like, uh, it doesn't include extremity. Uh, prediction, so statistical kind of prediction. But it is nice. It, it, it helps you to understand uh, which is the prognosis of your patient. It's important to say that this is just a start. So we are just putting in clinical information. We are working a lot also in, in biological information in these days. Uh, and now we know, for example, that, uh, and there was a nice and elegant study done in Australia and in, in Europe, uh, published in Lancet Oncology this year. This year on uh, 1,100 uh, problems, actually, who were affected by sarcoma, which found uh, that 55% of them have an excess of pathogenic germline variants, which is, in fact, something that was not expected at all. We always thought that, basically, sarcoma was just an incidental tumor in the, in the, in the, in the lifetime of your patient. But, in fact, this is not the case. They have a kind of predisposition, at least half of them, and especially the younger population, has a, has a higher risk of developing a second cancer. Even in liposarcoma, we actually found that 8%, 8% of patients who have a liposarcoma tend to have a second cancer, concurrent or subsequent to the disease, which is not trivial, actually. So tumor biology should inform treatment strategy and the extent of surgery included because, uh, because, uh, because you may tailor this, the surgical approach I've been talking about to the, to the different histologies. So there is no harm of preoperative biopsy. You should do preoperative biopsy, not only to, to distinguish between uh, sarcoma and non-sarcoma, but also to identify which sarcoma you are in fact dealing with. It's no harm. There was a lot of uh, discussion about whether to, if you perform a percutaneous core needle biopsy to a tumor, you actually are uh, uh, giving rise to a risk of seeding. But this is, in fact, has not been shown in retrospective series. This is a London series, and this is a review write, written by the, 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 the Canadian group showing that a seeding was, in fact, found, which something that could have been uh, uh, considered a seeding was found in two out of 547 patients. So it's actually not a problem. It's much more a problem if you don't know what is the diagnosis of the tumor you are, work, you are dealing with upfront uh, rather than having a seeding. Uh, in, in less than 0.5% of the patients that you are actually biopsying. And in fact, in our centers, basically patients who are referred for a sarcoma, for an abdominal sarcoma, they, it's a selection of patients who are referred for a suspect of sarcoma. 20% of them do not have a sarcoma. And what do they have? Often they have a lymphoma, which basically looks exactly the same, right? It's exactly the same. No systemic symptom, no, no blood test uh, uh, giving you the... And this is, in fact, a lymphoma. It's exactly the same. This was actually a professor, a hematology professor, who was actually under, uh, sent to surgery straight away, he came to visit me, and they say, okay, you have a 10% chance of not having a sarcoma. Just have a biopsy. He said, oh, biopsy, you're going to see the tumor. I say, come on, let's do a biopsy, and then you see what it is, lymphoma. So it became very famous because of that. But... But it also helps you to distinguish the different histotypes. Because, for example, here you see a big tumor pushing the kidney. Should you take the kidney, the kidney out? Yes or no? Should you take this kidney out? Yes or no? So the, the histology informs you in what you should do. So this is a solitary fibrous tumor. This is a dead if density liposarcoma. So if this is a dead if lipo, all this is a lipo, all this. If this is a solitary fibrous tumor, it's finished here. So it's a different approach. So with a solitary fibrous tumor, you in fact leave the kidney because it's a different disease. In liposarcoma, you just take it all out because you don't know where is the end of, this, of the, of the well-differentiated component. You don't see it. You basically don't see it. So you need to clear the, all the retrotoneal fat out. How about adjuvant in new adjuvant therapies? Where are we now? Should we consider before surgery or should they, they shouldn't? Well, in fact, what they found was that in, uh, in, uh, in, in the French uh, epidemiological study, they found that patients who had and they got, uh, the, the case of whom had been discussed in the multidisciplinary tumor board had a better outcome compared to those uh, who were not. 
So multidisciplinary tumor discussion, tumor, uh, tumor body discussion is important. So to think in a multidisciplinary way before surgery is very important. So I'll just show an example. This is a 32-year man with this large right side of the world lipo. So we have discussed the approach should be the widest, and, and the reason why it should be the widest is because these are the patients who really benefit the most from an extended surgery. They do not metastasize, they fail locally. But still, if you, ca if you calculate the prognosis of this patient, it is like that. So he has a 35% chance of recurring in spite of your extended resection. You see here, she's basically here. Well, the flight was 35% at, at, seven, at, at, at seven years, and it doesn't flatten out. So they still recur. What should we give uh, radiation? We actually saw, we actually looked at whether radiation therapy is uh, beneficial retrospectively. For example, in, uh, in, the, in the large 1,000 series patient, what we, we, which we looked at whether different strategies in different centers translated in different local control. So in well life lipo, this seems to be the case. So patients uh, were having the same disease, the same median size, but were treated with different uh, extent of resection. You see a lot of, lot of organs no organs, and more important, radiation therapy was delivered in no patients or in a lot of patients in, in, in the different centers. We should and keep some that, time. Yeah. Please, okay, one minute. I'm getting to it. Okay. And what was found was that <coughs> it, is, it was in fact the, the strategy with, the, with the, the extended resection and radiation which resulted in the better, in the better outcome. This was also found in a large uh, study in the, national, in the National Cancer Database. But whether this is true or not will then be, uh, will then be seen in a, in a randomized study, which is basically closed. So we actually we managed to close a randomized study on radiation therapy in, in Europe. We randomized 266 patients, uh, uh, and we hope to see uh, in future whether this is, in fact, the case. Um, so it's important to run a randomized study, uh, while uh, uh, in, in, in a patient where, uh, in fact, like this, where uh, affected by, by Lyme mastocoma, where the prognosis is basically based on distance spread, we don't have actually a study like that. So we don't know whether chemotherapy is, is going to impact the outcome. We know that you have cases that where you, you in fact, give chemotherapy, you have an impressive response, like in this case, but whether this is going to translate in a higher, in higher local control, and especially in higher survival, is still is, 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 is an open question. So uh, this, a group like the one we have been talking about is, is, is something that we will, uh, we will help to, do, to look at this. Now, I skipped this uh, on, on recurrence, but recurrence is a major problem. I'm not going to talk about this in the interest of time, but I just want to tell you that collaboration is, is a key to, to make progress in, in, in rare cancer like strategic coma. We have funded this, this group uh, uh, Guy was alluding to. We have put together uh, our effort to put together a registry. Is now, uh, this registry is starting 29 institutions, 13 European, 15 North American, one Australian and hopefully, hopefully also one here in Israel. Uh, and we expect to recruit in this registry 350 patients per year. And if we are uh, se several projects in the pipeline, and we hope that this will help a lot. So in brief, uh, complex surgery in sarcoma surgeons, histology tailored approach, higher risk for, of second cancer as compared to the general population. New RT is presently investigated. Chemotherapy is not. Salvage procedures have a limited benefit. Collaboration is the key and global perspective that is being started. So having said that, I thank you for your attention and invite you to Milan, who is a very, very nice city. I, if you have listened to, to Mitch's presentation yesterday, he invited to Chicago. Chicago is one of the cities I like the most in the United States, but also Milan is not so bad. And we also have a nice pizza. Yeah, you know that the Gino's pizza is superb, but you heard about the Gino's pizza in Chicago, but I mean, you have the one which I think is nice. Okay, thank you, Alon, for the uh, warm introduction. I'll speak in English, so... Uh, and um, thank you, Professor Klausner, for this invitation. Uh, this is a time for me to confess that uh, some of my best friends are surgeons, but, you know, this is the venue to say that. Uh, it's really a great opportunity to be here, more so yesterday eve, uh, when I met all my mentors. Professor Dost is here, classmates, uh, uh, I studied with uh, Doron Koppelman, etc., etc., many of my friends, and to see the young generation growing up, I really feel like an elderly, 
I have to admit, because I look at these young people and um, you find out they're already chairs, almost chairs. So it was really wonderful Eve yesterday with uh, someone who was really a, a genius in the guitar playing. So that was wonderful. I've uh, decided to start with this uh, study by Rupert Pierce, uh, published in 2012 at The Lancet. Uh, I happened to be part of the study group of the steering committee of this uh, study because it looked at the pan-European um, in-hospital mortality uh, involving 28 uh, European countries, uh, almost 500 hospitals, and you look at the number, almost uh, 50,000 patients. It's a prospective study, one-month study across uh, Europe, and it revealed a very high, very high uh, mortality rate, unexpectedly high, 4%. So uh, according to this, you'd rather not have your surgery in Poland or Latvia, but rather in Finland or Iceland. But still, it's a very high compared to the reference point, which was uh, uh, the UK. This study uh, did not specifically address the growing population, the elderly. So we have looked at the elderly population in uh, Ichilov in, uh, uh, in the last five years, and uh, we operated the super elderly, more than 85. We had around uh, 3,500 uh, patients, mostly us at two and three. Not surprisingly, uh, mostly women, because men do not survive to this age. Uh, not because they can't, they just don't want to. Enough is enough of these women, you know? So uh, uh, mostly orthopedic, general, and neurology, and ophthalmology surgery, and the mortality rate was 8%. So who is to take responsibility for this high mortality rate? And this is my lecture. Uh, we're going to talk about perioperative outcome. Is it a solo show um, or a salsa? I'm a salsa dancer also, so uh, for me this is the, the case. And uh, you know, we always say that success has uh, many fathers, uh, but the failure is an orphan. So I always look at the surgeons, and when it's successful, I did it, and when it's not that successful, I did not. So uh, someone has to take the responsibility, and it could be the team, uh, it could be uh, the surgeon, because it's a surgical patient. So I hope that by the end of this lecture, uh, we make this picture much more clear. And this is Alex Laser, he's a champion, <laughs> Israeli champion in salsa, happened to be my teacher, so it's really nice. Uh, I do have conflict of interest. A Maccabi Haifa fan, you cannot say it in Ichilov, as you know, a Maccabi Tel Aviv only, but I am a Maccabi Haifa fan, and I'm a fan of Real Madrid, uh, and believe it or not, I'm going to be this Sunday at the uh, Bernabeu, it's Teatro Santiago Bernabeu, uh, watching Sevilla versus uh, Madrid, actually we uh, fly uh, this uh, afternoon. So, uh, perioperative and outcome, I'm not going to talk about new airway technique, neither about anesthesia, short-acting drugs, not even about IRAS. I've heard that you had a wonderful talk yesterday. Somebody dared, Professor Gutman, was it you? I don't remember, yeah, to talk about pain. And yeah, <laughs> very nice. So uh, we call it, by the way, IRAS. You know why? That's the Israeli version of IRAS. You know, we always know better. <laughs> so it's like, a, yeah. So uh, no, I'm not going to talk about this. I'm going to talk about uh, uh, three topics again, only 20 minutes. Fluids, red blood, trans uh, blood cell transfusion, and uh, monitoring, and now how we as an anesthesiologist um, can intervene uh, or affect outcome. So the fluid thing, you know, uh, fluid has been around for so many years, but it's really in the last uh, decade or two that we started treating fluids like drugs. Every patient's coming to the emergency room, get his IV in and get fluid. Is that the right thing to do? Currently, we know that's not the right thing to do, and uh, regardless of what you give, normal cell and ringer or a colloid, uh, it has uh, its uh, problems. It is something which could be very toxic. And the approaches to uh, fluid therapy have changed through the years from uh, liberal to restrictive to standard to goal-directed. Uh, but actually, the main uh, turn was at 2003 with this uh, paper by uh, a female uh, surgeon, Brandstrup, from uh, uh, Denmark. She published it in Annals of Surgery, and what she showed uh, in colon surgery, 141 patients that uh, 
Okay, that would be a challenge. Where to find the pointer? Is this a pointer? Nope. Okay, there is a new one. Okay, just forget about the pointer. Okay, so what she found is the restricted arm uh, group, and she found lower complication rate, lower length of stay uh, in patients who received less fluid. Yet to be defined what is less fluid, but uh, uh, less fluid. So in the same time, we published uh, this. Excuse me? Can? Okay, let's try. Oh, it does. Thank you. All right. So it does work. It's even in green. Good. So, uh, sorry, our joke. <laughs> Okay. We always say, you know, uh, Professor Klausner, uh, uh, department is there is a yellow side and there is a blue side or yellow fluids. Together, it goes to green. So, 150 patients intra-abdominal surgery. Back then, I was in Adassa doing this study with uh, Itamar. I don't know where Itamar is today. I certainly know where Gidon Almogi is. And uh, so, uh, what we found is actually uh, uh, the same that uh, lower complication rate in the patients who receive, received restrictive, that was published in anesthesiology, the other one was in other surgery, uh, less patients, significantly less patients uh, uh, developed complications and significantly less complications. So, uh, we did it in intra abdominal surgery, not just con surgery, uh, uh, including sarcoma, um, uh, uh, Whipple, uh, hepatectomy, etc. Uh, there were other studies that we've been doing since in different patient populations showing lower incidence of hypoxemia, wound, compl wound complication, bowel complication, anemia and the need for transfusion, shorter length of stay and no effect on acute kidney injury, which is a totally different uh, 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 subject that I would love to talk about, but probably not in this uh, uh, venue, not, not this uh, Congress. So, uh, this is a study that should be published or has been published. I don't know, Matthias Eichermann is a German guy who moved to Boston. And it's, it's a German-Harvard uh, uh, combination here. Um, and, and this study, I happened to review this study, and uh, it needs, it's, I, I got the permission of Eichermann actually to show the results. So uh, it's about almost 100,000 patients and their fluid uh, management. And he looked at the effect of fluid management on outcome. And what he found is very interesting. It's one of a kind. He found a U-shaped association between the volume of fluid administered intraoperatively and 30 days mortality, cost, and post-operative length of stay. So if you follow me, uh, we're looking here at few quarterals. Uh, uh, very restrictive, less than 4 cc per kilo per hour very liberal, more than 15 cc per uh, kilo per hour and in between. So if you see with the very uh, uh, liberal fluid, uh, there is a certainly higher mortality rate, more spiritual complication, more aki, more acute kidney injury because the kidney is like a sponge. It's like the, the lungs. It, it, it absorbs the money, the, the fluid, and it's uh, 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 becoming sick. Yeah, it does cost more, so we talk about money, and it uh, lengthens the post-operative stay. Also, with the not so much fluid, okay, around 10 to 12, it can cause, it can cause uh, 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 le uh, length of stay to be uh, longer, uh, uh, so we should be aware of that. Whereas with the restrictive approach, very restrictive approach, it does increase mortality and uh, cause uh, post-op uh, aki. So his conclusion uh, was that moderately restrictive approach was associated with optimal post-op outcome. This is 6 to 7 ml per kilo per hour, which means that for 3, three hours operation, we should give around 1 liter, 1.2 uh, liters. If you watch your anesthesiologist, with induction of anesthesia, they give one liter. People just put the IV in, they open the fluid, and you know, when uh, you get into the room, or I get into the room, this first liter of your lactate is already in, and you have not even started surgery. This is part of mortality, okay? So uh, we certainly need to be uh, more restrictive than we are and to guide our people to do so. Uh, yeah, so IV fluids, uh, we've learned it is a drug, and yes, we should play restrictive. 
Now, it's very simplistic to, to say, okay, so from, from now on, we give six ml per kilo per hour. It's easy to remember. That's how we ventilate our patients, six to eight ml per kilo per hour, uh, as six ml per kilo. Um, by the way, this is also restrictive. We used to give much larger volumes, but, but by now we know that it does cause uh, lung injury. Uh, so in very high-risk patients, we should be a little more sophisticated, as we show here, what suits one customer might not suit the next. And we should take what we say personalized medicine, or in other words, goal-directed individualized therapy. And what does this mean? And it's a complex issue, because you really have to understand physiology. As an anesthesiologist, you cannot take this thing, goal-directed therapy, and just play with it. You need to know the protocols, you need to know what your targets are, whether it's uh, optimization of cardiac output or oxygen delivery uh, or, or whatsoever. You need to know whether you're going to give uh, a crystalloids, colloids, vasopressors, etc. So uh, uh, in your literature, or in mine, I read it as well, the analysis of surgery, this uh, uh, meta-analysis or uh, by uh, Lobo and uh, Rollins, uh, two prominent investigators in the field, showed that with goal-directed therapy, uh, you're going uh, to see much less morbidity whether you take the traditional care or you take the ERAS, uh, uh, ERAS uh, pathway. Nevertheless, mortality has not been shown to be affected. Okay, so it's uh, not a totally wincy uh, uh, approach, but uh, uh, certainly uh, more studies uh, are going on taking this uh, goal-directed approach, but you have to understand with goal-directed approach, again, it's a physiological challenge. Uh, uh, I have to admit that we adopted like in, uh, in my department, yeah, it's a, a goal directed. You need to know the different uh, protocols for uh, different uh, patients' uh, population. And as we all know, the elderly uh, heart is not uh, the young heart. Uh, the athlete heart is not like someone who has diabetes mellitus, et cetera, et cetera. And so why uh, uh, goal directed therapy is not adopted by everyone, and the answer is here, it's lost in translation. Not everybody can handle uh, these patients. Okay, transfusion. <laughs> this is a very emotional issue, to transfuse or not to transfuse. This is always an issue, and as we know, <laughs> okay, to transfuse or not to transfuse, uh, this becomes uh, very emotional in the room, okay, and uh, uh, I know those surgeons who operate quite well, they don't even lose one red blood cell in the field, but they still require to have uh, uh, at least 40 units for hair uh, uh, in the room. Okay, so uh, uh, why transfuse red blood cells, we all know. Yeah, we have to deliver some oxygen. I mean, the red blood cells are the workers and they're always employed, they're never unemployed. So uh, increase delivery and to improve tissue oxygenation. And when you talk to uh, physicians around, surgeons and anesthesiologists alike, why did you give this packed cell? And they said, oh, because the patient is hypovolemic. The patient did not give urine, yeah? Why the patient in PAC you has to get these two units? He didn't give urine, you know, it always astonishes me. Uh, for AFib, yeah, he became, he has AFib. To make patient's cheeks red, also this I heard from one of the surgeons, to strengthen the patient, mostly the orthopedic pay, people. Uh, some of the surgeons sitting here, yeah, we have to make the patient stronger. So these are really not indications to give blood. And as we all know, blood has its risks, and I'm just, not just talking about errors of viral transmission, uh, uh, the most important risk is infection rate increases when you give uh, uh, PEC cells. Infection rate, I'm not, I'm not talking transmitting infection, infection rate, pneumonia, etc. increase. Trolley, transfusion related acute lung injury, okay, RDS following uh, transfusion of PEC cells, TACO, transfusion associated circulatory overload, and the TREAM, which is a big issue, the transfusion related immunomodulation, and there are more and more studies suggesting that patients who were transfused have, ha have, have a higher uh, uh, recurrence rate of their uh, uh, cancer. 
So, uh, with all this in mind, there are several meta-analyses, excellent ones, that show that there is more harm in transfusing, in trans in transfusing than uh, benefit, and there is only one group actually that benefit. With these are the patients with the acute coronary syndrome, not coronary syndrome, but acute coronary syndrome. Okay, and uh, I, I list here just uh, prominent studies, but there are many studies. All it's it's uh, showing that if you give blood to anemic patients, it doesn't make his outcome better. Okay, anemia is a predictor; it's a marker. It's not something that needs to be corrected in most cases, obviously not in the trauma, bleeding trauma case, obviously, or if the, uh, the surgeon hit the aorta or the vena cava, portal vein, hepatic artery, whatsoever. So uh, this is study uh, was uh, the first one, Hebert and his group at the uh, intensive care patients, randomizing them to liberal or restrictive approach, the after coronary surgery, uh, study also showing that the threshold should be seven, seven, not eight, seven. Uh, the Tripicu, there are many studies on, in uh, uh, chi, uh, children, uh, pediatric group focused at the hip fracture, uh, Sergey Carson and his group showing that a uh, restrictor approach is the right way to go, etc., etc. So seven is the new ten. Okay, we don't uh, transfuse patients with their Hemoglo their hemoglobin is 10. We need to keep them normal volemic though, because we need cardiac output, but we do not need to give them uh, 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 blood, and actually it's harmful as I've shown you, and we can discuss it the whole day, and what pexel at a time. So I'm in the transfusion committee of, in Europe. Uh, this is the people who are, appear there on the paper. It's the transfusion committee of, uh, in Europe. I'm mm -hmm. part of it, and uh, we, sorry, Go back. Okay, so we've been looking at, uh, again, pan-European uh, study just published at the BJA, British Journal of Anesthesia, 128 centers in Europe, 15,000 patients. It was a one-month study. In these uh, uh, centers, uh, all patients that received blood at that same month in, around Europe. And uh, uh, mostly intra-abdominal surgery, uh, a about a third it was for cancer. And uh, what we found, uh, that's what we were looking for, pre-op hemoglobin trigger for transfusion, etc. What we found is that the pre-op uh, hemoglobin, most patients were anemic, no surprise. The trigger for transfusion was mostly physiological, which was really nice. It was not only hemoglobin-based, uh, which was only 8.5%, but it was uh, putting things uh, together. The hemoglobin level before transfusion was not 10. As you see, 8.1 is a little bit high, but it's okay when you look across Europe as a mean, how many units, and this is really the main problem. And then the next ESA, which is going to take place in Geneva at the end of this month, actually uh, we put together a workshop, a transfusion workshop to work on this, show the evidence. How about Tel Aviv Medical Center? Uh, in the last uh, years, we've taken an educational program uh, in the surgical departments and also together with the QA, uh, Quality and Assurance uh, Committee, and we are doing very well. I have to admit that, <laughs> surprisingly, in all, in all, uh, in all uh, uh, departments, I just show power to fit also in the internal medicine, obviously, uh, reducing uh, the, uh, both intra-op and post-op and uh, uh, we're looking here, this is the transfusion rate, and this is where it should be. I mean, there should be transfusion. Three to four percent is uh, in a big hospital. This is what we see in the well-developed countries, uh, hospitals. So, yeah, we should play restrictive also with transfusion. So I'm coming to the uh, last part of my talk, monitoring. Well, there is lots of money in monitoring, lots of uh, all these uh, companies uh, outside for the surgeon, for us it's the monitoring, and they uh, push monitoring, does it improve outcome? Definitely it does. Uh, this study, uh, this is the uh, close claim uh, uh, project looking at all death due to anesthesia in the United States, and with the invention of pulse oximetry and anti-dull CO2, capnography, there was a uh, significant decrease in the claims and death due to respiratory problems and uh, 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 increase in cardiovascular proportionally, obviously. Uh, when BIS was invented, depth of anesthesia, we didn't know how to do it, deal with it, but currently we know that it really helped our patient also reduce mortality, by the way. It lowered the dose of hypnotic uh, drugs. We know if the patient is asleep or awake. It facilitates recovery, facilitates control of hemodynamics, 
reducing awareness during anesthesia. This is a big issue, mostly for the hospital and the patient, or sure, but for hospital, they pay lots of money, and reducing delirium incidence. In the elderly, delirium equivalent to morbidity and mortality, increased morbidity and mortality post-op and in the ICU. Not less important is that it decreases mortality. If you keep your patients deeply asleep, deep, that, uh, in these terms it's less than 40, your long-term survival is lower. So there is something going, uh, happening there, whether it's cognitive dysfunction or whether it's delirium, she, you should not keep it too, too asleep. How about hemodynamics and ca cardiovascular function? Well, these are all these tools uh, that we use, the recent, most recent ones. Each one of us has this app, and we can examine the patient and see, uh, like, uh, not like, it's an ultrasound, and that's how our screens look, much more sophisticated for those anesthesiologists who understand. <laughs> yeah? Okay, and I want to give a few examples uh, because this is real life. So this is, uh, I think uh, Dr. Diane is here. The, you remember this case, obviously. Yeah, so we had this patient, a 46 years old male, uh, with obstructed diaphragmatic hernia and severe pulmonary hypertension. Uh, uh, the numbers of pulmonary hypertension was like systemic, like 100 or so. Uh, uh, so you look here, it's like 85 or over 35. Uh, but this is after treatment with an O. Uh, nitric oxide, um, uh, milrinone, uh, and flolan, a prostacycline, and uh, uh, we could not have done it if, we, if I would not put in a PA catheter, obviously. So this is a, a very easy case regarding speaking of monitoring. How about this case? This is a case uh, that I did uh, with parotidectomy, an okay patient, morbid obesity, heavy smoker, hyperlipidemia, however his uh, uh, his heart rate started increasing 60, 50, 40, 30. So 77 can be uh, uh, 6 sinus, but I decided, to, you know, you put a TE in, you find that there is a regional wall motion abnormality, a new one, you, it's a, it, it, you see it's in front of my eye, and then you start treating the patient. So it really gives you a diagnosis and additional idea of what you're going to do. This was a 45 years old woman coming for revision of THR, uh, smoker, hyperlipidemia, that's how she looked in the beginning of surgery, that's how she looked right after, not so good. And when uh, we put the TE in, uh, I wish it would work, so now it works. Okay, that's what you see, a huge thrombus coming from the right atrium to the right ventricle, right atrium, right ventricle, and she collapsed. We put her on a bypass machine. Uh, the uh, cardiac surgeons actually uh, were working. They took it out. We got her alive out of the operating room. She died uh, eventually in the uh, cardiac, uh, card cardiac unit. And you cannot think of yourself doing any liver transplant, post pulmonary uh, uh, hemorrhage, complex uh, cardiovascular operation without this machine, the TAG machine. And this was in the um, annals of surgery uh, last year, looking messy transfusion protocol, guided by TAG, not guided by TAG, improved survival. So currently we, we have TAG in every room in the trauma center, in the obstetric unit, everywhere. We just send the sample and we get online results on our uh, screens in the operating room. The anesthesiologist, you cannot work without it. So. Uh, monitoring is an add-on. Yeah, you should look at the surgeon, what he's doing or she's doing, uh, and uh, you should look at the patient, but it's an important add-on, early warning, diagnosis, and treatment. And uh, yeah, it does affect outcome, but it's a little bit simplistic to look at it this way. I just come from Washington where we had a whole day talking just about blood pressure. Because when you think about it, and this is just an example uh, to finish, uh, wrap up this lecture, what is a safe blood pressure? What is the threshold type? Should we take like systolic less than or 20% below baseline? And what is baseline? In the department, at home, in the admission area to the uh, uh, operating room, etc., etc. So uh, just to give you an example, in this study by Dan Sessler from the Cleveland, looking at 33,000 uh, patients, they found association between intraoperative hypotension and postoperative aki and myocardial injury. And when you look at it, Every minute, when the mean arterial pressure is less than 60 or more so less than 55, you have a higher probability or higher risk of having acromyocardial injury. That translates to significant morbidity and mortality, obviously. 
Uh, in our patient, and this by the way, my mother, she's 92 years old. Uh, she was also an anesthesiologist, professor of anesthesia. Anyway, so uh, we also looked at it. In the super elderly, what do you find? It's totally different numbers. So what is a safe? We don't know what's safe. For elderly, it's systolic blood pressure that less than 100 results in Aki and higher mortality rate. So it's a simple thing. We don't talk about cardiac output, oxygen delivery, SVR, PVR, whatsoever. We just talk about systolic blood pressure less than 100 in one group, and less than, we talk about 70 to 80, that's the next studies, which I'm not going to show today, yeah. So monitoring targets need still to be defined for each patient population and each diseases, okay? So, in conclusion, yeah. Uh, While well, you're operating, it's an anesthesiologist's role to take action to help improve patient outcome, and we've discussed some of the issues, not only about antibiotics uh, being given uh, half an hour before the operation. Uh, it's uh, much more than that, and pain definitely is part of it, as you've heard yesterday from a surgeon, uh, Professor Gutmann. Yes, we can do it. Uh, peri outcome, definitely, it's not a solo. Yeah, and uh, um, I'm, I'm, I'm always amazed uh, uh, with some surgeons who do not pay attention uh, to what's happening in uh, the OR. Just, you know, they're so concentrated, so focusing. I think it is a salsa, and uh, that's the way we look at salsa, right, Professor Klausner? Yeah, I don't know, this is probably several ca hundred cases we've done together. So uh, I would like again to thank you all for uh, your attention.